Are you a finance auditor or a CA or CPA student who gets intimidated or confused when someone says ITGC? Terms like provisioning, change management, they sound too technical, right? But here's the thing, you don't need to be an IT expert to understand them. In fact, during audit scoping or your day-to-day -day work, you will be working closely with IT auditors to better assess the control environment and it is only desirable that you understand the basics of ITGC. In this video, I'm going to simplify key ITGC controls that you can understand what are the key risks and what you can test during your audits. So let's get started. So ITGC stands for IT General Controls. So think of them as the foundation of your IT environment. They ensure that the systems are secure, the changes are authorized and the data remains reliable. Without these controls, your financial applications cannot be trusted. These are the controls that support the integrity of financial reporting systems and they are working behind the scenes. Now let's begin with logical access management. So in simple terms, it is about who has access to which systems, what they can do and whether their access is appropriate. So some of the key sub processes here include user provisioning. That is how are users getting access to the systems? Second, user deprovisioning. So how are users removed when they leave or when they change roles? And also how are their permissions updated if they move to different roles? Then we have periodic access review. So this is done either monthly, quarterly. So it is basically done to identify if there are users whose access needs to be terminated, to identify if the access rights are appropriate. And then you have privileged access management. So privileged users are generally super users or admin users who have access to multiple functionalities within the system. And it is a very restricted access. It is typically an SOS access, an emergency access, because these users can step in and make the requ required changes if things go wrong. So that is why it's very restricted. And that's why one needs to check if the privileged user access is appropriate. Then we have password policies because a weak password can result in compromised accounts. And lastly, we also have segregation of duties. This is very important because without this, there's a high risk of fraud. So if a single user has access to multiple functionalities in the process, for example, if the same user can create an employee record, can modify the employee bank accounts and can process payroll or salaries as well, then there's a high risk of fraud. So we need to ensure that there is adequate segregation of duties to prevent such scenarios. So if you are given the task of preparing a risk and control matrix for ITGC controls, then you can look at the earlier video that I have uploaded where I have included all the key fields that are a part of risk and control matrix. So it will include your risk ID, control ID, the control type, whether it is preventive, detective, what is the control frequency, whether the control is manual or automated and so on. Now, one point that I want to add here is that the granularity of risk and control matrix is subject to your judgment and also subject to the organization or client that you are auditing. So it depends on what you consider as the process. What is your starting point? For example, what if I considered ITGC itself to be the process? So in that case, what would be my sub process? So the sub process would itself be logical access management, change management and other areas which are a part of ITGC. And then how I frame the risk is also up to the auditor, up to me in this case. So if I want, I can have a single risk which is holistic enough to capture everything that can go wrong in logical access management. For example, a risk statement could be that unauthorized or inappropriate access can result in fraud. And against this, I can have mapping of corresponding controls like controls for user provisioning, access review, access deprovisioning and so on. So now you see there is an element of flexibility and judgment and it also depends on the control environment and how operations are structured at the client that can help you in designing the most appropriate RCM for the client that you are auditing. Now in this video, for example, I have taken each area like logical access management, change management and so on as a separate process with sub processes defined for them so that it will be easier for me to explain to you what are the risks against each of the sub processes. Now let's move to change management. So change management controls ensure that any changes to the IT environment are properly reviewed, tested and approved. So what kinds of changes? They could be software updates, configuration changes, 
anything that can impact system performance or financial reporting. So how does it work? Someone raises a formal request to change a particular system or process, and this is typically from the business teams, and that request is reviewed for its potential impact on operations, security, and compliance. So this is called a change impact assessment. And then finally, the change is approved by the authorized personnel, and then shared with the software team or the IT team to make changes. If the change is approved, the change is developed and tested in a controlled environment to ensure it is working as intended. And then after the testing is completed, the change is deployed into the live or production environment. Also, a quick distinction between SDLC and change management. So SDLC is software development lifecycle and it's a framework that provides the structure for organizing and managing software development activities like your planning, analysis, design, development, testing, then deployment and overall maintenance. And this is typically used when an organization is going to adopt a new software or a new technology. Whereas change management controls are particularly more important for managing changes to softwares that are already in use or for smaller scale updates to the software. So while the scale of implementation differs, there is an inherent segregation of duties irrespective of whether there's change management or SDLC. And the key risks here could be that unauthorized or unapproved changes are promoted to the production environment or changes are promoted without uh, testing or the changes promoted are not according to user specifications. Now let's talk about end user computing or EUC. Now this refers to reports, models or macros which are created by the business users usually in Excel. And yes, spreadsheets are everywhere. So the common EUC tools include Excel workbooks, access databases and macros and sometimes even small Python scripts used by finance teams. So what are the risks? The spreadsheets may have broken formulas. There's usually no version control. Anyone can change a file and no one might notice. And the changes aren't always tested. These small tools can have a huge impact on financial reporting. For example, the company may have a monthly revenue computation model in Excel, and it had a formula which was accidentally changed by someone, and it is now pointing to the incorrect row. So Consequently, the revenue may be overstated even before anybody notices. So following steps are involved in EUC management. So firstly, there's an inventory management wherein we identify and maintain a register of critical EUC tools. Then there's an EUC risk assessment done by the organization. So they classify all EUCs based on their level of risk and impact. And also the organizations have the EUC standard for governance or development wherein they establish the guidelines for how the EUCs should be built, tested, and documented. Then there are also access controls which restrict the access to the EUC only to authorized personnel. Also backup and recovery to ensure that backup EUC files are there. If you like, you can add the different aspects that we just spoke of, that is the inventory management, governance, access restriction, as a separate sub-process under EUC. Or if you want, you can keep it high level. Whatever approach you follow, make sure it is consistent across all areas you are auditing so that your RCM or risk control matrix, when it is consolidated, it is consistent and easy to understand. So let's wrap up the last part, which is IT operations. So this is the day to day running of the IT environment. So think backups, job scheduling, incident handling, all this comes within IT operations. So what are some of the sub processes here? So on the screen, you can already see a list of sub processes. Now let's simplify and understand what each of it means. First, we have batch processing. So what is it? It's like running a group of transactions together at once. For example, instead of paying each employee one by one, you are processing salaries for a batch of 500 employees at once. So it saves time and it reduces errors. And that is why the risk is that if this batch processing fails, then it can impact the data quality, it can impact the operations. Next, we have job scheduling. So it just means automatically running tasks at specific times. For example, journal entries may be posted automatically based on the scheduled time. So if this fails, it can impact operations. Then you have data integrity. So it just means ensuring that the data is correct, complete, it is not altered accidentally or fraudulently. So this is also critical when there are multiple systems and data is exchanged between the systems. So you want to ensure that the data flowing from one system to the other is accurate and complete. 
then we have exception handling which means managing errors or any unusual cases so in this case it is important to identify the errors timely so that corrective action can be taken then we have monitoring which means monitoring the system downtime because if there is a downtime in system which goes undetected it will impact operations then we have backup and recovery as you already know it is important to backup data then also disaster recovery because if there's any calamity any disaster we want to be able to restore operations without any critical business impact then we have log retention and integrity so what is that it is ensuring that the activity logs like records of who did what in the system are accurate if someone changes a payment file before it's sent to the bank the the system log should capture exactly who made the change when what was changed so it helps in having an audit trail and accountability and lastly we have incident management so whenever there's an outage whenever there's an incident it needs to be recorded so that corrective action can be taken and also we can prevent such incidents from happening in the future